Harry Walliter had ridden ahead of his team of rangers in search of water. The sun was setting and darkness was overtaking the landscape as his horse walked at a steady pace along a trail he was familiar with from his days as a mounted soldier during the Anglo-Boer War, which ended only a year before. His only companion was his faithful dog, Bull, who trotted alongside his horse with him. He would soon need to set up camp and build a fire so that his team, only a few miles behind, could find him in the dark. At 26 years old, Harry had been given the responsibility of being the first and only ranger hired to patrol the Sabi Game Reserve, later to be included in the most popular and well-known national park in the world, the Kruger National Park of South Africa. Game populations had been severely reduced during the war and the state with the war behind it could now focus on the task of rebuilding the game populations. Conservation is an old practice. Walliter knew these lands as well as any man. Growing up there and living a life of freedom to wander, hunt, and work, he gained the knowledge that made him the best man suited for the job. Once working as a big game hunter, and a good one at that, he later stated that as thrilling as the big game hunts were, he loved observing the animals in their natural haunts, and that he never regretted the metamorphosis from hunter to guardian. As his horse carried him forward on that hot evening in August of 1903, he noticed movement in the grass ahead. Having been this route many times, he rode it off as an antelope called a reed buck. They were plentiful in the region. He expected them to run across the path in front of him. It was now dark and he was making assumptions. As his horse strolled along, two lions appeared in the grass only four or five yards away. A female, which quickly moved around to the rear of the horse, sinking her claws into the horse's hindquarters, while a black-maned male made for the horse's head. Spurring his mount to get it moving proved to be futile. The lions had his horse, and in the confusion, Walliter was thrown off his horse, almost landing on top of the male lion, his rifle being slung in the grass out of reach. As the dust rose, the horse somehow broke free from the lioness's grip and galloped ahead at full speed with the lioness in pursuit. His dog bull followed the lioness. Walliter lay on the ground dazed with the maned lion on his right. Immediately, the big male rushed him and bit into his right shoulder and shook him violently. Walliter went limp and the big cat then began dragging Walliter off to eat him. His head held tightly against the lion's mane. He writes in his memoirs that he could clearly smell the lion, which smelled strongly of, well, lion. And he could hear and feel the big cat purring like a domestic cat, but much deeper and louder. The big cat obviously anticipating his meal. Walliter also mentions that he strongly disagrees with a Dr. Livingstone who apparently had written that the bite of a wild animal is virtually painless due to the nerves being numbed in the process of the bite. To the contrary, Walliter describes pure agony from the bite. His body was facing the cat and being dragged under the lion's belly face up. Now and then the lion's front claws would rip into the flesh of his forearms and wrists. The cat was stumbling on Walliter's extremities and torso. Thoughts raced through his mind during the nightmare. He was surprised the lion did not bite down on his head or neck, which is the tactic lions use to instantly disable their prey. He also wonders if the beast will kill him before he begins his meal or will he eat him alive. All these thoughts, 60 yards, the distance measured later by Walliter is a long way for a lion with a human in his mouth, so the man had time to consider the situation. Remarkably, Walliter is lucid enough to remember his knife strapped to his belt on the right side of his waist. He had lost this knife on previous occasions after taking a spill on his horse and hoped the knife was still there. Reaching across his body with his left arm, his right arm useless in the lion's jaws, he feels the knife as he writes in his memoirs to his indescribable joy. 
He begins to feel for the lion's shoulder. Knowing the lion's anatomy, he knew exactly where the lion's heart is located. He made two swift backhanded plunges into the side of the lion. The cat roared furiously and released his bite on Walliter's shoulder. Falling to the ground, he quickly jabbed the knife upwards into the lion's throat. He is certain he hit a main artery because blood poured from the lion and soaked his shirt. The lion ran ahead into the darkness. Walter staggered to his feet, not knowing for certain how seriously he had wounded the lion. He could hear the long drawn out moans of the beast a short distance away. Then he thought of the female lion that had run after his horse. It would unlikely catch the horse and would soon return to its mate. And there Walter would be holding his knife, completely defenseless against an adult lion. Thinking quickly, he lit a match and tried to set the grass on fire. The lion would surely leave the area, but the grass was wet with dew and would not light. He chose to climb a tree and with his belt strapped himself into the tree. Lions are perfectly able to climb trees, but he was out of options. He was thirsty and becoming lightheaded from shock and the loss of blood. The male lion's death moans eerily filled the night air and then went silent. Walter's team would soon be coming down the path and he would be found if he could just hold out until then. Just as he feared, the lioness returned. A sense of doom swept over him. In the moonlight, he watched the cat go to the spot where he had stabbed the male lion and then follow his scent straight to the tree. He was doomed indeed. The big cat sank its front claws into the bark of the tree and was about to reach and pull him out when his dog bull arrived and began tormenting the big cat. It drew her attention away from the tree and every time she would return to the tree, the dog would start the process all over again. He would make a mad rush at the cat and retreat when the cat turned to attack him. Bull would lead her out into the grass, always staying just a few feet from her deadly claws. This went on for hours. Walter writes that he was feeling faint at this point and that his thirst was terrible. He tightened the belt holding him to the tree. Then, in the distance, he could hear the clanking of dishes and the pack of one of his associates walking toward him on the trail. He yelled to the man and instructed him to climb a tree right away, that there was a lion in the grass. Walter's man did just that. The rest of his team arrived shortly after. They scared the remaining lion off with the gunshots, helped Walter from the tree and built a fire so that the injured man could assess his wounds and rest until dawn. Four days of walking with his wounds severely infected and a raging fever, Walter's team made it to a small camp where he could have his wounds dressed. His men apparently did not believe he had killed the lion. There must have been some talk of it during the last four days of misery. It was unheard of for anyone to kill a lion with a knife. Now that he was settled and could rest, he sent his men back to the crime scene to locate the dead lion and return with its skin. From detailed instructions, the men found the lion precisely where Walter had said, skinned it and returned with the hide and the skull. They also verified that the heart had two wounds from a knife. He slowly recovered from his wounds, but suffered from damage done to his tendons and bones the rest of his life. When he would speak of the wound, he would refer to it as his lion bite. Walter went on to serve as a ranger at Kruger National Park for another 44 years. He wrote of his experiences in a book, Memories of a Game Ranger, published in 1948. The book is not currently in print, but copies may still be found for sale. The skin and the knife used to kill the lion are on display today at the Stevenson Hamilton Library in Pumlanga, South Africa. There is a plaque marking the place where Harry killed the lion and the tree he climbed is now dead, but the stump is well preserved and encased with a brick and mortar wall. You can see it if you go there. Today, if you ask any park employee about Walter, they will tell you the story just as I have today. Harry Walter is a legend. His son, 
Henry Charles Walliter followed in his father's footsteps and was a ranger in the park. Strangely enough, his son Henry raised a lioness cub at the family home. He called her Elizabeth. Harry Walliter's grandson, Kim Walliter, is a renowned wildlife documentary and filmmaker for the BBC, National Geographic, Animal Planet, and the Discovery Channel. There is no documentation on whatever happened to his faithful dog, Bull. Hi everyone, this is Cam. I remember reading about Walter. He, his name showed up in a book I was reading probably about 10 years ago about African wildlife. He's one of the few, he was mentioned in the book as one of the few people who actually survived a lion attack and killed the lion with a knife. What a man. So I dug deeper, I had to know who this guy was and learned his story over the internet and through a couple of other books. And I'm glad I got to share it with you today. Hope you enjoyed it. All right, we'll see you guys on the next video. Thanks for watching.